Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce you Roberto Maranca, who is a vice president of uh, Data Excellence in uh, Snyder Electrics. It's a multinational uh, company, very big one. Uh, Roberto is uh, now uh, giving a lecture, a very interesting one because it's, uh, it's uh, his uh, hobby and also work <laughs> since uh, 20 years in London. And the title of the uh, talk, uh, you can put on the first uh, slide, Roberto, is a Digital Neo-Humanism and Data Excellence. Uh, we are on. It's, yeah, it's a new perspective to an old problem data. I think this is a, a should, should combine all kinds of uh, uh, in uh, background knowledge that students of data science and also students of uh, other uh, courses uh, where they've uh, met uh, statistics, but also ethics of big data. Here there is also Nicola Russo. We, we are sharing this uh, space. We will thank you, uh, Nicola, for uh, offering your hour of lecture to this very interesting uh, seminar. We could not allocate this seminar in the Picariello lecture, but it is like uh, Picariello lecture, so we we are very pleased for that. So please go ahead, Roberto. In the case uh, um, you like to to have uh, some questions during the, yeah. your talk, or you prefer that? No, no, uh, uh, please, please, please. I'm so very happy. I'm I, very... I know, I know you. I've met you in uh, various courses. <laughs> Uh, here there is also Michele Sayano, and Michele is a very good friend of you since uh, the time of university. We're five. And I also <laughs> think, Actually, thank Michele five. to offer us uh, this, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, nice uh, bridge to uh, uh, Snyder Electrics and also to you. And I hope that, uh, well, that students will be uh, interested in uh, your talk and pro possibly there will be also some opportunity. To, to, to organize uh, some stage and opportunity for students to, uh, to work also in Snyder with you and uh, to uh, evangelize uh, all other people uh, about the data and quality of data and how to, I mean, to mind about uh, the use of data. Okay, yep. so I would like to give you time, so I stop talking and uh, right. so. Okay. Everybody likes uh, making questions. Uh, we sh you can uh, raise a hat and hand, and uh, we will give you a, a space. Uh, it's nice if we interact with uh, Roberto. He's a very nice guy. Okay. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me all right? I mean, uh, you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. So, um, okay. So the the I have a few slides and. Uh, a couple of disclaimers just to be on the same on the same page and um, uh, i know that people are tending to have a bit of multitasking when we do these things but because the slides are pretty pictorial you, if you the, the way they say in english if you snooze you lose it right i'm gonna go pretty fast so if you have your face on the screen you can follow me otherwise you might gonna lose good so as I was saying, yes, the um, is there, there aren't too many slides, um, but I'm going to go fast, uh, but I hope you, it's going to be audible and understandable. Don't hesitate to stop me whenever you want. I'm like an old comedian, so I can go back to my material, no problem whatsoever. I actually will enjoy a bit more of interaction. I will enjoy someone that will raise their hands and say, you know what, that's rubbish. That's that's good. That's good discussion to have because in data, like in philosophy, the most important thing is about questions, right? So, first a disclaimer, and just to be on the same on the same page, um, I'm having a bit of a background noise. I don't know if you can go on uh, on mute. Thank you. So the the disclaimer is that I mean it's me. I'm talking about what is my experience. So you shouldn't exactly make a connection to my employees uh, employers, but um, what I'm trying to represent is the story of what I learned through data and my and my pre prior life to data, which was mainly IT. But I'm an engineer, and you'll see that for a while. Another disclaimer is that if you're here uh, learning about uh, the next tool that the wrangling, sorry, wrong wrong seminar. I'm not going to discuss tools today. Similarly, if you're here because you like very complex technical diagram, sorry again, I'm not here to discuss that. So I'm trying. What I'm you're going to see here is. A mixture of three things. One is what I see that is happening in the world of data, right? And then what it means for me 
when I'm a, being a data professional, what it means to operate that, to change, make this change, because we're going to talk about a lot about change in an organization. And lastly, we want to reflect on what it means to us as human beings, as um, customers, as employees, as fathers and, uh, and mothers, from an ethical point of view. What does this data thing mean? So, and when you're going to get to the... Uh, in the business world, uh, what you will find out sometimes that people are, are going to tell you, hey, but this is not rocket science, right? What, what they're trying to say, this is not complex. Well, being myself and uh, Michele here are actually something you might define a little bit like rocket science. And I want to just tell you that this is a formula that the only formula you really need to go to space. And it's something that a guy called Konstantin Tsiolkovsky put together on May the 10th, 1897, finally was published, 123 years ago. So for the rockets, there is a very clear formula. For the data, however, there is no formula. So, and what people will tell you, oh, data is like the new oil, or oh, data is an asset. That's what you hear usually in the, in the business world. But what I think is that is data is like a nuclear fusion. We're just starting to smash things together and we're getting a lot of release of energy. And we are excited because we, through this release of energy, we have started to think about something like this, right? For my generation, I mean, if you don't know what is this, I have a homework for you to do from a film viewing point of view, the Matrix. But as, a, as you start to see this thing, this data becoming ever more presence, omnipresence, almighty, and you start to see now everything like data, actually, I thought we, we need a term for that. And the term is coming a bit more from my scholastic, by, scholastic background. I think we're approaching a pan-doministic world. So pan, everything in Greek, in Greek, the domina is data. Well, I'm I'm cheating a little bit. The domina is actually the, the I think is the participle pa, uh, past for uh, to give, but never mind, works. So the pan-doministic world is something that all of us are excited about, right? We like to play, doing mining, science, but the, the reality is that what excites us is scaring, scaring the bejesus out of the crowds. And what you see, what you need to understand is that we are, we are really dealing with this. We are dealing with a, a machine that at best is 500, under, no, at the minimum is 500,000 years old, and at best can barely manage with some basic needs, sleeping, eating, breathing, other things. And so, the case of a digital neumanism is to simply say that we are excited of bombarding this machine with things where we, we are presenting them as the future, as the science, the progress that is going to unlock incredible things. The reality is that what you are seeing more and more these days, this is producing fear, anxiety, alienation. Actually, you are starting to see neo-ludistic, you know, was uh, Robert Lude, like was the guy that was smashing the, the, uh, the, 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 the looms, the automatic, the first automatic looms, the ones that were creating the uh, automatically or uh, with a machine, the fabric, and that basically was the beginning of the industrial revolution. So we need to deal with the fact that there is a imba imbalance between what the practitioner of data are trying to do and they are excited about and what the rest of the mainstream, the humanity and people out there are fearing. Maybe I'm not going to have a job tomorrow. Maybe the vaccine is not good for me. Maybe I don't want to have an algorithm telling me what is my next shift. Like in Amazon these days, right? It's this morning news. And we're going to go on strike. And if you think we can go around this, if you think in the future, that's going to be not a problem because the machine will, all, will start to become the prevalent thing. You need to understand that what we do in a company, what, every company is not a charity, and actually even a charity, at the end of the day, is trying to sell something. And the, the act of buying, whether you are a CEO of a company, buying a company, whether you are someone buying a pair of shoes, where you are someone clicking on a phone and ordering something, that act is emotional. It's not a machine. So humans will always be central to the digital world because at the end of a chain of data, supply chain of data, or an information or, or a marketing action or a digital commercial of some kind, there is always going to be a human. Unless one day Alexa will select a song because Alexa likes it. So when the 
machine will start to make an emotional choice. When my fridge will say, mm, I don't think I like EDF current, I prefer the Aeon current, and then I'll switch my contract. When that will happen, when machine will start to make a emotional kind of a, uh, uh, exercise or, or uh, uh, action, then things are going to change dramatically. But I don't think we are anywhere close to that. Are we still, you're always still with me, right? It's only 10 minutes into this. I think that I can interrupt you. I mean, yes. well, to tell you the truth, I am so fascinated by this start because this really reflects what I have been saying for years and years and years. And you and say in, this. in English, in English, they're saying great minds think alike. That's what they say. Thank you, well, I'm, <laughs> thank you very much. Let's go ahead. And the because uh, all these facts about artificial intelligence is just a marketing strategy made to sell old ideas which are immensely successful but it has nothing to do with artificial intelligence we are still far away it will happen maybe but it will be maybe in 2060 maybe never yeah and uh, what i was what saying do is machine learning is yeah. not artificial intelligence they are two different things and actually i'm i'm saying i'm doing a poc on machine teaching which is another <laughs> thing Sorry. as well. But so but but then I need to translate that to what it means for me, right? So as a as a data practitioner. And really we need to think about what makes a successful company in 21st century. And I'm looking at what are the typical things you need in a company at a very high level. And uh, think about it, when I start working in 1995, to have the same power as a, I've also a limited company, just have a, a limited company because I've done a bit of a work in between works. And today, as a owner of a limited company, I actually can have Google as my IT team. And it's never happened before, right? So technology is no longer the dif differentiators. The processes are no longer the differentiator. What is the differentiator? The differentiator is how a company can put together its people with its data. So how can I make sure that my people are using the data to do the best for whatever is the outcome or whatever is the intention of the company? So what's the issue with that? The issue is that is now we're talking about people. You see, the, the point of digital neo-humanism is that all this are massive technological advancement and this incredible availability of data is pushing in the foreground of our action people again. So, and what happens is that a uh, company will start to think, oh, but yeah, we are a bit of a silo company, so we have to break the silo because if we don't break the silo, we don't collaborate, we don't do the right thing for the customer. The problem is that you see silos, I see tribes. So the reality is that in a company, you see people coalescing around the fire, sitting together, and basically listening to the stories that their own, you know, chief will tell and there are there are groups you can observe the company they are basically thinking and talking and having the same habits and they are becoming an enclave that it's a very bad thing new bad news bad news for data but by the way this animation took me half an hour so i think i deserve a bit of a clapping this but <laughs> that, that's that's a different point <laughs> so so what is the bad thing for data? The bad thing for data is that data, data flows. Data doesn't care. Data will end up in the hands of your customer, your regulator, your investor, even your employee these days, because the employees are actually asking data from company. And if data is not good enough, they don't care if it was the IT, sales, marketing, finance, operation, tribe making dirty. They're not gonna, they're not gonna, they are gonna reject it. So that's what I, when I'm, what I'm thinking where I have a problem with the culture of a company if I want to solve the problem of data. The other thing I have as a problem when I want to solve the problem of data is that no matter how loud they will tell you that is the new oil, but when it's down to the critical moment of change, which is what, what is change in a company? A company wants to change because it wants to achieve something new, something that is more competitive, but they want to deliver a new, uh, a strategy, they want to deliver a new a new program of, or a new product. So there is, usually there is a, a change happening. So there is a project, there is a program of delivery. So what happens? That program will 
think about process change, think about IT change, think about designing for process change, think about for designing for the IT change. But what they do, they forget about data. Data is an afterthought. Data is something that all of a sudden, while they are now getting to testing, people will say, oh, and as personal experience, oh, but this dashboard is not showing me the right thing because data is not good. So having been an IT guy, the IT guy reaction will be, well, but you are business, so data is yours. I'm system works, I don't care. But the reality is that data cannot, the, the solution cannot be adopted, cannot be rolled out. And so what people are doing usually, they're this scoping data. They say, let's go ahead and we do this in what we call BAU, which in business term is business as usual. So meaning, let's roll this product out, let's roll this dashboard or let's roll this algorithm anyway. And while we are working on it, while we're adopting it, we're making it better. So a secret that I wanna share with you is that operationally focused company have no time whatsoever to fix things in their operation because they are so lean in what they do that 100% of the time of employees is dedicated to their processes. So they cannot do also data on top. So what happens? Company will keep on doing change and data will keep on doing, being bad. So there is a, a effect of the two major factors. So the complexity will grow because the more things you do and you don't do that very well, the more complex it's going to be. The bad change that you, is actually created more complex. And these two, these two systems are feeding each other. So what you're seeing these days in company is you're getting to a sort of a complexity tipping point. You are getting to a point in which company is becoming so complex that you're having the proverbial flapping of butterfly wings here. Oh, I was just changing this table and all of a sudden an entire product line falls down. Why? I don't know. But what I can tell you, this is a typical, in a pandemonistic world, this is a typical symptom of a company that has got too much data debt. Now, if I was to, to pitching to you this first time, I would have probably talked about data entropy or data entropy because it's the disorder of your data. But because I'm talking coming from a financial background, I think the concept of having a debt that is accumulating is actually resonating to them more. And in, in effectively, it's like imagine yourself, you're keeping on getting another loan getting another mortgage and you are expecting someone down the line, which is still yourself, will go, is going to repay it. But the reality is what happens in our digital transformation and what happens that gets closer to what you guys want to do, I guess, is you are called to do, oh, let's do the next best algorithm that let's mine a bit of this. And then you spend the first 90% of your six months just making data better to use it in your algorithm. So your algorithm now works, it's good, it's good predictive. Then you go to your boss and say, look, how shiny, I've done this thing. It can predict the, uh, the propensity to buy uh, based on the shoe size of the CEO of the company that we're going to deal with. And they oh, right, fantastic, let's put in operation. The blimmin thing in operation gets into the real operational data, which is bad and dies, doesn't work. So that's how the majority of the digital transformations are happening in companies today are failing because they are not sorting out their data debt. The data debt is the trickle, is the mud in which you're trying to wade and trying to run as a digital company, but you can't. And nobody wants to sort it out because it's expensive. I am sorry, but you said that we can interrupt you. I yeah. think that what you are saying is extremely interesting this is something which we have been discussing with Nicola quite long the problem which is strictly connected to the problem of causality in data basically the fact that as a friend of mine said uh, machine learning causality lost in translation basically yeah. paraphrasing you know, the more. Uh, and this problem I think it's not only important for the for the marketing application or for the companies. This no. is a, absolutely general. For instance, in the field of health, it's crucial. It's crucial in the field also of... Uh, it's uh, a pandemonistic world, so it's every, absolutely. everywhere. Absolutely. But the problem of causality is really... Mm, one. I think it's the main problem to be solved in this. One of the two main problems to be solved. But the, 
Yeah, well, so, when you talk about causality, I guess you're also referring to the fact that the fact I have bad data, if I look at the references of data in my computer, so there are there are golden taxonomies okay. that I sh they should be exactly. golden, they should be the exactly. same, because otherwise, if I make a measure in data, because in data I would like to make a measure, right. I don't know what is this, my axis of reference are not the same. Exactly. So, so and uh, you say, oh, so I, I see this. Well, and it, you know what's the typical experience of a, a board these days? Everyone is sitting around the table and I say, oh, how are you doing, says manager of the north? I'm growing 3%. How are you doing, says manager of the south? I'm growing 3%. How are you doing, says manager of the east? I'm growing 3%. So how come the company is going down 5%? That's, that's the data problem the companies are having today. So any other questions? I'm, I'll stop for a bit of water because um, tell me if I'm running too fast. I'm talking too fast or um, I'm not understandable. Uh, I'm happy to, to slow down or to stop. Uh, it's oh, dense. It's okay. It's okay. But it's very dense. I mean, it is dense. The same dense you are seeing would require, you know, a seminar on its own to be true because especially for people who are more experienced and who know what is behind what you are seeing. Yeah. And it's uh, really you are touching some points which I think uh, really would deserve a, a lot of discussion. But, but, but we, 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 because we are now having the, uh, the 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 recording, we can do it like in the old days. If I use an Italian name, we can we can <laughs> la possiamo sbobbinare. <laughs> right. Right. But we can invite you again for an, uh, a part two. Yes. Okay, Agostino, so let, let me... likes to, uh, Agostino likes to uh, make a question. Okay. Yes. Agostino Mere is a PhD student of second university attending. Uh, okay, so his, uh, hats down, Agostino. You want to, to make a question, uh, Agostino? Yes, yes. Just, just a brief one. Can you uh, please spend just a few words on what you mean uh, when you say, when you refer to bad data? Uh, are those data that are, have not been well maintained or? Uh, 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 I don't know, like a uh, couple of examples, yes. Yeah, a couple of examples. Uh, so uh, the typical example is I have collected um, all my customer data, right? And I should have collected all my customer countries uh, because on uh, the because I, I want to know where are they living? What's their address, for example? And let's suppose that in my application that is collecting that I have no control on the address and basically my people are too lazy to go and uh, drop down the country and search for a Zambia right because that's from a guy from Zambia and what what is happening is what I call the Afghanistan effect so all of a sudden 60% of your, of your customers because there is no control are living in Afghanistan because the is the first picking uh, if the first pick in the list so there is no control, is there, is now accumulating there, there's been no, uh, no verification, there has been no validation. So whoever goes in and trying to say, I want to know what's the dis distribution of risk we're having for our customer across different countries, will find an, an enormous concentration of risk in Afghanistan. So but like this, uh, you have, a, I, I could say that there are typical three generations, three causes for uh, the the bad data. One is a bad change. One is a legacy, you know, application that has been there, just uh, collecting data that has been never verified. And the third one, and uh, that is an interesting one, is when you have um, a merger and acquisition. So uh, you acquire a portfolio, acquire a company, and you bring into your environment all their data. And basically, you don't do any efforts to merge your data, to normalize your data, to standardize it. So you just slop it on. And there you go. You have uh, additional accumulation of bad data. I know it's simplistic, but works in my mm. head. There is also. So Roberto, is it like in our course of data mining, we have spent a couple of lectures on data preparation. So all these methods and techniques they are not applied in a such big uh, multinational company, isn't it? Is <laughs> this is uh, the right, case? So the, the, no, issue, no, the issue is that they are applied. If I can complement to this, there are also different things. Very often, uh, especially nowadays, that data collection is beginning to have some history. We have also the problem that uh, in many companies, you inherit data which are coming from different ontologies. 
Correct. So basically, they are intrinsically not incompatible, but this is not clear unless the data are provided with enough metadata that you can spot the difference. But this, especially in company, never happens. But also, the the what I what I usually see is the effect of a country itself. They doing things well. They are like a solo uh, musician. So they they are incredibly virtuosos. They can play fantastically well. The problem is that if you put them all together, you try to create an enterprise understanding what's going on in a certain area of different countries. It's like putting musicians that never played together use in, a, in, a, in an orchestra, and then you get cacophony. So not necessarily any of the question, any of the the way the music they're doing is wrong. It's just a put together doesn't doesn't work. So let me you need, let me. You need the, you need an ensemble effect for. Uh, you need an orchestration layer, which is the metadata layer that uh, Pepe is describing. The met, the metadata, the 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 meanings. I have something about the meanings. Is that orchestration layer you need so that everyone knows which music, what tempo they are they are playing on, right? Makes sense. So the other big problem I'm having is, and that's a very big one. Don't don't underestimate this. Nobody can actually quantify quality. So if I go and ask to one of my sponsors, all right, you want to do this? How much you gonna get? What is gonna be the benefit? Please give me quantification. People cannot make that. Uh, they usually say, oh yeah, there are three people today working in Excel. They are doing some stuff. So if you do that automatically, uh, I will save 20% of their time every day. But that kind of a benefit from a business point of view doesn't fly with the, in the eyes of a CFO or a chief financial officer. They will reject that with a business case analysis because you need really to have someone that understands if I do this much work to fix my bad data, I'm going to get this much benefit if I try to power my my systems, my outcomes, my decisions. And that, that's an art that no, that's a skill that doesn't exist in in our companies. It's not very, it's not very common. You need to understand that as well. And the other thing, which is a paradox, if you ask how do you want your data, the only question, and because they are not, they cannot quantify the quality, right? The only answer they can give is 100%. So how do you give it to me perfect, or I can't use it? So a concept of good enough for me doesn't exist because they cannot create a connection or back to what you say, Pepe, a causality between how good is the data, how good is going to be my business process, how good is going to be my, my decision. So this is all that can, grow, can go wrong when we do data. And what I do, then I try to picture myself as a data personal trainer. I like to, in the digital neo-humanism world, we also know that people are getting a bit of a fitness fanatic. And what I do, I try to say, all right, this is where data excellence comes into place. And so understanding that these, if you want to do data in a company, if you don't want to do data well, you need to, like a personal trainer, you need to start to ask and question their mindset. So are you really want to do this? So what is exactly you want to do? You want to run a marathon? You want to lose weight? You want to run 100 meters under nine seconds? Because these are three very, very good ambitions, but each one of them will have a different regime, a different training uh, schedule, a different diet, a different, you know, resting. And so first thing, you want to check the, mind the mindset. Second thing, you want to give them methods. So now that I understand what you want to do, we're going to put in place something you can repeat, something that will take your, shed your pounds, remove your data debt as much as possible, because what you want to you want to get to data is to measuring what is your value, what is your what is your improvement. So if you do this, if you have your mindset, if you have your method, and if you start to measure the uh, the uh, the benefit, like a person that goes for the first time in the gym, you know the first seven days would be hell. But when you start to see, oh, I'm losing weight, oh, I'm actually improving my personal best, best there's going to be a reinforcement. Again, we are working on the endorphins, the endorphins here of a company. There's going to be an enforcement. Ah, this is good. This is actually getting better. And so if I look at the data excellent gymnasium, so what I try to bring in a company is mindsets really becomes the culture. 
because this is the the soul of the company is the remember the tribes the different people the actors the uh, the humans that are involved in this methods becomes change because you need to have a, a methodology to change to counteract the problem that data is a uh, an afterthought and finally the measure is the value you get so these are the three pillars and i i, I go through a few of the things i'm going to these pillars just to give you a sense it's going to be dense but um, we're not far from the end <laughs> okay so there is a nice word that is i'm getting from japan it's called japanese it's called nemawashi nemawashi means the work you need to do around the roots of a plant before you you have to work the soil you need to make the soil ready for the plant to be planted and that's what you do with culture you're trying to create the fertile soil for having a data strategy, a data activity that is good. So you need to have someone from the top that says, I want to do this. I'm personally committed and unequivocally, I'm going to tell you all people in my company that data is important and I'm going to tell you that it's going to be tough, but we are here to do it because there is a positive uh, effect for a company at the end. People like me, are very exposed if they're not getting this because i can tell you that in chief data officer jobs with the ones that i'm trying to do and perform every day your average survival is 17 months it's a sort of a honeymoon after the which after which sometimes the company says ah you know what don't like the way you do data why because it, were, it wasn't clear at the beginning there was not a lot of a you know commitment from the top Sorry, is this to do with the fact that usually to implement this strategy takes longer than this 17 months and people give up before? Exactly, it's a marathon. Process. Yeah, exactly. So, and the issue politically for us is to put enough roots in so that when the moment of rejection, because there is a moment of rejection, it's like when you run, right, Amara? There's a moment is, I want to give up, that's enough. And is what in in uh, in athletic terms is called before the second wind. You know, the second wind is when you go beyond this uh, threshold, and then you uh, you you feel a bout of energy again. But definitely, I can see in companies there is a moment in which ah, oh, this is too much. We can't do this. We need to change, and it happens. Yes, because these 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 strategies are pretty lengthy. So, so that's one thing from a cultural point of view we need to do. And the second thing is that. I was describing to you uh, the we were talking about the bad data, but like, the story how bad data is formed is this. Look, so there are places of data. So there are people that are owning the data on the box. You know? There is someone that has got a system where uh, there is a system of source. We are collecting data there. We are doing some stuff. And then there are the people that want to use this data. So the story goes like, hey, have you got this for me? Because I need that, right? Yes, I got it, but it's not exactly the way you're asking it. Okay, so can you change it for me? Because I really need it from my CEO. No, nope, I have no budget, no time. Take it as it is or leave it. And the answer is, right, I'll take it. And what, what the, user, the user of data will take that, and then what's it going to do? They're going to make it better. They're going to change it. They're going to use Excel ninjas, as I call it, to craft a different version of the data. That's why you create a multi, uh, multiverse that is no longer resembling or is actually loosely connected. There is no causality anymore. There is no referential integrity. There is no definition integrity with what was in the places of data. So from a cultural point of view, that's the, there are many too many of these happening every day. And that's what kills companies from a digital point of view because you are having a, a multiverse all the dialects these are reinforcing those tribes i was saying so from a cultural point of view you need to insert a third party the third parties are people that are owning the meanings of data pepe this is what you were referring before from a metadata point of view so i have someone that has got the right to say what a customer is what the customer type is what a uh, address is made by and what are the reference systems to validate that address so these people are transcending the let's say the technical layer they are more like the owner of the meanings and they are the guardians of those meanings so if i want to use something if i'm someone says 
I need the customer table and I want the customer table. That's one of the users, right? The consumer, let's call it. I need the customer table and I want the customer table split by 25 zones or split by the 15 customer types. And this request goes up to the to the meaning to the owner of the meaning is they, which will say yeah you can have that and i can tell you which system is this in because i know i certify that as a good system but in this company there aren't 15 customer types in our company we use 12 customer types and these are the ones and so that requirement then passes down to the guy that owns the system and the uh, the fulfillment of the request is done properly so that's that's a virtual circle, circle that the more you do it the more you clean, you clean and you're trying to rectify, to standardize and to reduce a little bit. This is one of the way in which you reduce not only the tribal effect to data, but also you reduce a little bit of that data that we were discussing before. And now if you understand that this is one of the roles, there are going to be more roles like that. You also understand that the typical teams that are today making up the, the data teams. And by the way, data teams are very young in their formation. So most of the data teams these days are XIT people. They are now starting to move up the chain and trying to be more business people, as they say. But the, the, these teams are now going to have to add some more. And as they say, they're going to need to shift more on the left, on the requirement side, and shift more on the right, on the consumption side. What I mean with that is that you need to start to bring in semantic experts because you need to start to have someone that says, ha, huh, I understand you want to say that to the customer with the product, but we haven't got the data concepts to do that. So we need to either create them or we need to find them. So from an ontological point of view, I need to give you the background, the tools to fulfill that request. Or you need to have communication experts because data is difficult. Data is not understood, is misunderstood. Data is either IT or AI, it's never data. And so communication is key, explaining people. I do this kind of a webinars possibly once a month internally. And I do exactly the slides you're seeing are exactly the slides I'm using for them. Because, and sometimes I'm, uh, people are shocked <laughs> because sometimes it's far from what they're believing data is. But the reality is you need to have an incredibly good communication skills because you need to treat this as a, a as something a, as a media campaign then with which you hit all the different layers of your company and why not you start to have a, you need to have visual artists the number of times that i was in a room where i pulled on the screen something that i thought it was incredibly beautiful from a technical point of view i did the most fantastic analysis of things and because of the way the colors were put together the words were put together the the pictures were put together it was misunderstood and it took me like half an hour to bring my stakeholders my sponsor back into what i was believing i was believing they had to understand it doesn't need to be underestimated and finally and we're going to get to that from a from an ethical point of view I have a bet with my daughters that in 10 years, companies will be hiring philosophers and uh, for consul consulting the boards from an ethical point of view. And possibly it's not going to even be 10, 10 years, possibly less than that, because it's too much at stake, too much, too many big questions that company boards cannot answer with the models and with the four operations. It's a, it's a different world and we're not equipped for that. So that doesn't mean that you should change your uh, your faculty or your uh, your subject, but I'm just telling you that you for uh, being success successful at this, you need to be a bit broader. Questions? Okay. We have Nicola, we have Nicola Russo in uh, our so, team. <laughs> yes. I to say something in this respect also because there are many of our students there. This is why when we planned our master together with Roberta and Antonio Bicariello and so on, we from the first moment, you know, in Italy, it is compulsory to have in any data science master a course on legal aspects. Absolutely. And we, uh, well, having to choose, we substituted it with a course on ethics of big data, because we think that law is something which you can learn because you will have lawyers in company. Yeah. 
But yeah. the data scientist needs to understand at least, you know, in a, in a superficial way, but really needs to understand the ethical implication and the philosophical implication of data. Yeah. And this is why we have the course of ethics, theory and ethics of big data in our master, because I absolutely agree. I mean, philosopher will be crucial in the future to... Uh, and you just have to, I don't know if you know Luciano Floridi. Uh, oh, I think he's a bit of a celebrity in, uh, rep in, in, in Italy with the Republica. I think he's been... To tell you, but, you don't yeah. agree on most of the things. No, 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 but, but, the, but he's, I know, he, I have... he's been smart in putting yeah. some things out there. And I think yeah. he's getting more and more main, mainstream, which actually helps all of us. Yeah. So there was a, any other questions? No. Um, I'm going to go quickly on a few pages. So because the other big thing that we need to do, and this is more of a, let's say, not the technical part. This is now the method, right? So how do we, how do we give my teams, my company, the exercise to do? And the first exercise to do is we, uh, you might be familiar with the fact that in a company you have a portfolio of things to do. So there are so many changes, so many projects, so many activities. So as a data team, we need to start to look for uh, the data important parts. So what are the key projects? What are the demand? What are the things that the business wants to do that I really need to focus on? And I need to try to bring a product features out. So if you look at the list, sometimes is oh, change this system, uh, move these people, uh, close the office. But we need to really try from a, from a data, if you put the data lens on it, there are benefits, there are synergies that you're trying to achieve. And that's something that it doesn't come natural as an exercise. Most of our PMOs, project, ma project management offices, are not used to look at that. And that's something that is important. Why? Because then for those projects, you want to give them a special exercise. So this is now when you, what I was mentioning before, people are forgetting about data. So this is the typical phases in which a project through a company will go. It's very abstract. They say you have, you have demand, you, someone asks for something, you design what to do, then you build it, you deploy, simple. So the methodology I designed for a Schneider is attaching to this is the exercise. Ah, you want to do a demand? Ah, good. So usually you treat a demand with a, an agile, you do a user story, you're going to tell me the data story. What's the data story? Is, I'm going to give you this data tomorrow. What are you going to do with it? What you trying? What is going to be the next action that is going to come out of your mouth, I mean, next word or next things you're going to do when you receive this data, who you're going to give it to, what, how are you going to decide whether it's good or bad. So all of this has to be understood at the very beginning because I need to have the ability through designing for data and to creating conceptual modelization, creating all, capturing all the that metadata and then deploying with a, the good operational uh, model that allows me to maintain the quality improve the quality and or manage the changes on the metadata and so on. I need to be, to be able, every time I do one of these projects, what I'm doing effectively, I'm repaying a little bit of the data debt. I'm building a muscle, if I build a muscle, I'm shedding fat, and that data debt is going a bit away because now in that area, I've done something good for data because I follow this practice, learn, repeat, practice, learn, repeat. And if you Think about more uh, if you're a fan of agile methodologies, then what opens up the the uh, the, the the door is to the creation of a productization of data because data is inherently agile. So you should look at it as something that is a product you continuously improve. Imagine you have all your customers and with all the addresses, all your customer identity, and you can put a team that is continuously making it better continuously checking those addresses, continuously adding more customer from a system that I was including at the beginning, continuously, you know, creating more sophisticated rules to say that a customer that lives in the customer address uh, and has got this legal address should not receive, uh, should not have the legal address into the logistics system, I should have the, the, uh, the, you know, the plant address. So you can continue to do that. And if you do this, you basically create what is the most important thing in getting the value of the data, which is you calibrate for people. You explain them, this product is good for you because now I understand your user stories. I understand what exactly you want. So instead of building another one, I give you something that I was working on. It's there, you can reuse it. In fact, if you are familiar with the FAIR 
uh, framework or the fair um, methodology of approaching data. Fair means findable, means accessible, it means interoperable and reusable. So these are the four characteristics you're trying to create into your uh, data product. So people can find it, can appre appreciate it, can reuse it. So you don't, you minimize the cost. And that, so the more you do this, the more from uh, you, you create your, your, these products, you connect these products, you understand the relationship between the products and the company of that. And, and then what, if you roll forward and you look at the future, the future of what we do is not the super duper algorithm. The future of what we do is an enterprise digital twin. So is that the representation of your company from a relationship, from a, a mega super ontology that is now codifying or is, uh, is actually the um, design is in including the intelligence of all the people that all the humans that are uh, intelligence is around there. They know about their application, the process, the outcome, the policy, the people. This put together in a, in a twin of your company that you can use to simulate, you can use to measure risk, you can use to understand your operational resilience. And it's not it's something that people look at and say, that's science fiction. Well, okay, if you keep on thinking of science fiction, your company will probably be dead in 10 years. I think it's something that people have to aim for, to have a from a philosophical point of view, you need to look at this twin and you need to have a, a know thyself moment, right? And nothing is held on. A Socratic way, so I can see myself through my data. And if I see myself through my data, I know where I stand. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm, how far I'm from my objectives. I know what my risks are. I know how do I need to respond to regulations. I know how to make things transparent for my customer. I'm actually a digital company. All right, so the ride on the technical part is over. Now we need, we go back to, this is what I do, I try to bring into the company. We go back to a reflection, where are we going with this as humanity? We are at the crucial junction. So on one side, there is the utopia in which us, the data experts are the heroes. We are gonna create jobs and opportunities. We are gonna sell, solve, the sustainability paradox, which is how we can have growth for everyone at a sustainable cost. Uh, from an economical point of view, from a, an environmental point of view, data is the huge, big optimizer of the pro big problems that we're having in the uh, humanity today. This is one side that it can happen. But on the other side, if we're not careful, we are going to seen as a menace. We are the people that are actually fooling the populace. Eh? We are the people saying that are create destroying the and AI is going to destroy jobs and possibly if you believe it in free, the free will. And data is going to be weaponized. And you want to see a weaponization of data? Think about fake news. That's weaponization of data. So that's where our, we are looking in front of us. So we need to be careful. This profession is possibly a profession has got the biggest potential disruption power on humanity and is a potential is a profession is not having any code of conduct whatsoever and data out there if you understood from a humanistic point of view has become a sensitive uh, subject i don't know if you know gdpr as a regulation i don't know if you read gdpr i managed i implemented gdpr in three places so far and i'm on the third one and that's probably the toughest one but the recital for the one is preceding the legislation says something very interesting that you never seen in any other regulation. The process of personal data should be designed to save mankind. I challenge you to find any other regulation that's got mankind written in their purpose. And but it's normal because if you think, I don't know if you know it, but GDPR is actually enacting Article 8 of the European Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. By the way, just so you know, Article 10 is freedom of speech and Article 11 is freedom of religion or the other way around, I don't remember, but big stuff. We are dealing with big stuff, but not only we are dealing with big stuff and we should be uh, conscientious about that, but also we need to understand that the growth in a digital world will come from ethical treatment data. Why? Because, you know, the, the, the usual uh, deal, there's uh, things are feasible and there are things that are legal then there are things that are ethical, and then there is what I call trust. 
And the, <coughs> and the envelope of trust for me is the point the point in which companies may be a bit utopically, but you need to try you need to understand as a company, there's gonna be a moment in which you will say, I can do this, but should I? And so more companies are thinking about how do I have the customer trust in me? Because in a digital world, trust is a currency that goes immediately. So you are it's it's a value that goes. So you lose your trust from your com customer, you lose a customer. And the the stickiness in a digital world with all the disruptor is very, very thin. So you lose your trust. There is um, something bad in the news, something reputational, and you use a, use your market. So data ethics has to be part of our companies, but it cannot be inculcated. It has to be enthused and to be fed into. So I've been putting together for Schneider, I put together a charter of data in which one of the principles is about uh, ethical responsibility on data. And now I'm happy to say that that has been in globe, uh, is put in, into our existing code of conduct. So now people, every person in Schneider, every year, they need to attestate to the code of conduct. And one of the principles of code of conduct is I should not do anything that is wrong for data. And because for my customer using data, because that's what we're gonna do. You wanna create an internal mantra. It cannot be, this is not a project. Ethic cannot be a project, cannot be a policy. It has to be something that changes really the way people are thinking and pe the questions that people are asking themselves, the sensitivity to certain type of questions. And so if you are sensitive as well to that, I put together something that you probably should take as an oath. And if you want, you can take the oath with me, but as a data practitioner, you should solemnly pledge to practice your profession with conscientious and dignity, to respect the privacy of the people whose data is confided in you, to maintain the utmost respect for the individuals whose data I'm, you are analyzing, and to be transparent, open, and honest about the type of analysis you are applying to their data, and to never, never, never use your knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. So this is something that I've been pushing out and it's something that I think we need to be more explicit about because if us we cannot be explicit of what we, that what we do we want to do with conscientious approach to data then I don't think we have a lot of a we're going to go down that dystopian side so last thought for you now that you've seen all of this don't forget and this guy is Ronald Coase is the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economy, and you see, being a some apparently, he was a bit of a philosopher, and you can see philosophers are living long. He actually died when he was 103. So Ronald says something for all of us. He says, "Touch data, and he will confess to anything." That's it. Thank you very much. Questions. Thank you. I mean, this was an amazing. Thank you very much. For that talk. No this worries. This was an amazing lecture. Yes. Well, I I know that uh, I during the, the few uh, times that we have uh, spoken to each other on uh, on the web, I understood that uh, there is a quite charismatic uh, character and. Uh, yeah. I no. <laughs> And and also, it's uh, it's uh, well, uh, in simple. Uh, I must say that when you uh, have, um, uh, you you got such a long experience uh, uh, that you can make a very simple. Uh, it's the scar. It's the scars on my back. Yes, right? some important scars. messages, <laughs> and I well, it's uh, it's amazing. I, I think this is uh, well, this seminar should be on on. Uh, should be given in our channel. Uh, Pepe, you are uh, our social uh, <laughs> media player. <laughs> oh, we sure are recording this also this. Uh, but, uh, so if, a, is, if there is yeah, any question, I, yeah, I would I'm happy like to take to... questions. I'm happy to take questions. I mean, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Please, because I, mean, I want to make, um, because, you know, for me, it's difficult to gauge the audience. So I want to make sure that you, because there might be concept for me, I'm a bit, you know, they're uh, unpacked, but maybe for you are not, right? So it's uh, happy to to take questions. So if people are still alive, if people are still alive, right? <laughs> in the first yeah. following. Okay, if there, there is any student or whoever, 
all other I, I think there are most most people well, are related to Alessio. Alessio, 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 su, Alessio. go Wait. ahead. Go ahead, Alessio. Ciao, Good Alessio. evening. Buonasera a tutti. Yeah. I have a question that's a little bit uh, particular that comes from my experience because I'm work I worked in a marketing company, but I'm working in a betting industry, that's for more. A lot the, of data, a lot of data, Alessio. Yeah. And me as data scout, I don't have any kind of code of ethics, but instead of my agency, instead of telling me you have to behave as an ethic person or something similar, it's more like a treat. They say, don't make anything that it's not ethic because we will uh, bring you to, yeah. to problems or anything. And this not only reflects on me that, that I'm the last part of the chain, but also at higher levels because these data are really valuable and have a, a value of a lot, a lot, a lot of money and interest in because it's a live data about football, basketball and everything and anyone can bet on it. And how can this company start to be ethic, not only with the person, but with themselves? Because uh, this kind of change of mentality cannot bring from outside. If it does start from inside, it's impossible to have. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky question and strange question. No, no, I think I think you see that many times. So the the two you have to have a certain maturity of approach to ethics to be to understand what are the levers you need to push to to have ethics well positioned for sustainable future. Because the the imposition is the easiest thing to do. Don't do it. Right. So what what happens when you say don't do it? I'm not thinking I'm following a rule. If I follow a rule, I fail at ethics because ethics is not based by rules. So they and so what they're gonna do? That today that they don't do anything stupid. How do you know what is what is stupid? So, because I I was finding myself describing that in one in certain scenarios, you know that we, now, now teams are uh, less when we were having an open space. It was oh yeah we are all we are in, in a hub we are doing an hackathon and then we have a beer and pizza and then maybe after that just for fun you might go into your um, data warehouse and checking. If I can check well, selection a couple of, couple of features between the payment, you know, history of a certain person and their postcode, I can find my soulmate, you know, in my area. Is that stupid? Maybe it is. Maybe my maybe it's absolutely unethical. So putting an imposition creates an onus on the person putting an imposition to codify the imposition. And in ethics, that doesn't work. Because ethics boundaries are com continuously changing. So you need to have people being able to question themselves, question the person who's put in the imposition and having another conversation. And that, so it, the, usually when you do something like that, an incident sooner or later will happen and things will need to change. <laughs> I'm not wishing it to you, but I'm saying that uh, the, if you try to make a rule, a law out of ethics, it's the wrong approach. Roberto, yeah, can yeah. I comment? To, oh, sorry, Alessio, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Alessio, sorry. Because Maybe, uh, I now I'm a surgery a bit, but for example, I cannot talk about that with other people, with my job or everything. It's against the law. But for me, it's not against the ethics, because if I have someone, someone that understood about that, or someone that wants to know about that, for me, it's ethic and good to talk and maybe bring a a better thing to my company and not to yeah. say, don't don't talk about that and stop about it. Why, why we should why we should be uh, I don't know if in English it doesn't work omertus you're right it's all about having the questions and that's what I have done with my team at a certain point I said all right let's suppose that tomorrow morning we our procurement team uh, finds out that our sorry our system finds out that checking connecting the the uh, Facebook feed of the person in the procurement team, the buyer in our customer, and our visits, we can get 30% more sales because we go and visit him when he's happy. Would you do that? Yes, no, but let's have a conversation. I mean, let's not say, no, you can't do it, but let's have a conversation. Maybe we can, maybe we can, maybe it's a good idea, but we need to have a conversation. We need to be adult about it. There is no taboo. Tribes are having taboos. <laughs> If I can comment on this, uh, Alessio, I think that the problem is also that we are in a transition era. Because what uh, Roberto is uh, speaking about is a, is a special segment of the companies. Basically, they, 
they are uh, the most advanced now. Those companies which really are dealing with this problem, this transformation, which I think it's will be unavoidable, are just at the the tip of the iceberg. This is a movement which is starting now. I think that uh, in a short time, let's say, because things move fast in 10 years, 20 years, the ecosystem will be such that companies with unethical approach to the data will be automatically taken out of the market. Yeah, the, tr the trust is not going to be there. Exactly. So if I don't trust you, I don't give you my data. And, and because in 10 years, the imbalance between the company ability to use my data and me, uh, um, the uh, an ability that I have to stop you to use my data is going to be on my favor. So then you're going to start to have data sovereignty. So I, I'm sitting here, I say, ah, this morning I read about company such and such, it's a bad thing. You know what? Click, you don't have my data anymore. And it's not going to be me doing, please, can I have your data with a website? I go and I need to please begging you. No, no, no. I will be able to control from here that from that moment onwards, you don't see my data anymore. And so you're done. That's a bit of a digital socialist uh, thought, but um, I mean, I think it's going to get there. Roberto, may I ask you, but if you from, can you say a percentage of your data in such big uh, multinational uh, like uh, Snyder Electric is you are now working uh, since uh, more than 20 years. If you want to say on percentage, what is the percentage of your data that you can define them data excellence? So that you can certify that uh, your data <laughs> in terms of percentage. Okay. Uh, from zero to one. No, no, okay, okay. So I, so actually, I have, I mean, I have a number. You are improving a... this process and how no, far no, I, I, I can give you. <laughs> Look, uh, real, and funny, funny enough, we are working on exactly that kind of maturity dashboard. So we, because I, I, I created day one a logical data domain. So we have basically a view of all the different domains of data, which is a, let's say, let's say is a flat ontology, if you want to put it like that. But so we have 32 domains and mm -hmm. uh, I think I have... Uh, well, you, you can make also a confidence, it's not in terms of, I mean, you can estimate such percentage in terms of your confidence about that your data are excellent. Well, if, I, if I look at all the data of the company and uh, the things I can put my hands on uh, probably is, what is it, 5%? Yes, this, this is what I expected. <laughs> uh, because you know it's a long pro it's a long process, and you, yes. remember the, the the practice learning repeat. We are just doing that in six uh, uh, data products today. So six data products is are although they are important, right? But the they are not the totality of the company by all mm -hmm. means. So we are we are focusing on the most important one: the orders of the company, the sales of the company, the customer of the company. But they still. I mean, if I look at the totality of it, there is a, a lot more to do. And if I look at the quality, it's still something that... So really the, the important decision of your company are uh, based on 95% of your data. No, I don't. Now, now you're interpreting that. <laughs> you know, no, no, because no. there are, of course, there are there are a lo long uh, process of rectification, yes, validation. Yes, yes. But yes. if I, if I had to give you, if I give you access today to something, and uh, what's the likelihood you're going to get something that you're asking is data excellent? That's what the li probably the likelihood on the face value. So there is a Lorenzo. Lorenzo yeah, likes Lorenzo. to make a question. Lorenzo is a, uh, the Lorenzo yes. of economics. Economics? No, no I'm a teaching okay. assistant of uh, Professor Lusso. So ah, okay, I come okay. from a philosophical okay. field. So, Good. And uh, I'm really Good. interested in the, in the border between uh, uh, Utopia versus dystopia. So, in my philosophical background, I studied uh, a little bit of uh, Esposito, Simon Weil, uh, about the, the, the origin of the Constituent Act. So, um, what I would like to ask to Roberto is, uh, who is the subject that have to prevent us from uh, fall into dystopia. Um, I try to explain myself. Uh, uh, I know that the law always uh, originated originated from a violent act. So uh, if, I have to put, if I have to um, 
to, to um, make a constitution or a law or the GDPR, I have to have a, a, um, a power on an institution, a power... An imposition. A, an an imposition. imposition. Okay, it's a violent act. Uh, but right now, uh, is there a subject that can... Um, uh, impose, that can the impose, impose this ethical approach? But you say me that there is no... No. So, as I understand, the change has to happen on the civil society plan. Then so, think, it is a, yes. so it, it is. So, there are the enterprises that uh, uh, have to promote a, an ethical approach. Which they are doing already, if you think about all the enterprises that yes. are embarking in the CSR. Are you familiar with the corporate social responsibility? And okay. there are ESG goals now, so the environmental sustainability goals. So there are corporations are necessary, not because they are charities, but because back to the point of trust. I think to go and work for someone is a choice you make. And okay, who you so want to work for? I find this 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 um, this argument uh, quite Marxistic. I explain myself. I know I'm a digital say... socialist. I should know. <laughs> my mom, yes. Sorry, you should know. My mom has been teaching 25 years philosophy, and my father was on the upper car going and doing uh, you know a public speech with the Communist Party. So I'm a bit of a <laughs> yes. <see>? So <laughs> it, 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 it is not a question. So I, I would like to ask if I understand uh, if I understand your argument correctly. You yeah. think that so it is, I think it I made it your father. <laughs> it is the, the, the competition, the capitalist competition, that will allow us to have an ethical approach into the firma, into the companies. Because, because the companies that doesn't have an ethical approach won't have clients. So it Correct. is the concurrence of capitalism that would lead us to a new kind of approach. I think at the end of capitalism, you find the socialism. So uh, you th it's a dialectical movement, you, see, you, you, ah, you say. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't I originate think, from law, but from a dialect, a dialectical movement I think, inside. I think, do you know the what the laws are doing today? You, you know what the laws are doing today, Lorenzo. The laws are trying to catch up with the problem that the, with the gap they are having since the peace of Westphalia. So the laws okay. today are actually legislating on the digital world that is already escaping under their under their borders. So the laws are late. So the yes. digital world, the, the data, the pan-doministic world will be necessarily, possibly a pan-socialistic world, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yes, but because my, I, I'm, I'm doubtful about the laws, you know, because the, the, the European laws are usually weak. Yesterday I saw a really interesting uh, uh, documentary on the television about the, the selling of weapons on, on Rai 3, about the selling of weapons. So it is strictly forbidden in Europe to sell weapons to uh, dictatorships, but, not but, actually, but so actually the they're web. doing it. No, no, they're but doing it. Web. Italians sell weapon to Egypt. Well, so yeah, on the yeah. law, there Lorenzo, is something well, written, well, but nobody respects criminals. Lorenzo, well, you well, always well, have criminals. But go, go and read now what China is doing with the cybersecurity rule, law, Article 37. They okay. are actually uh, they are saying that every important piece of data must say in China. So yeah. you see, comp the states are trying to close the gaps, close the, the, the leakage of data, because data is, econo economy is security, is prosperity. So mm -hmm. they are struggling because it's like putting a, 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 a the, 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 the proverbial finger in a big dam that is about to fall on the head. So yeah, it's, I think the, the, as a group of data people, we need to be conscious of what kind of an impact we do on humanity. Probably, That's why I'm, I'm having the, the pledge, right? Because I, I believe that people have to, to be sensitive. Entropy. If Sorry. I can contribute to, to the entropy, I think that all okay. this also enters into the fact of globalization, because this is also an incredible strength which we must take into account. Yeah. Data are intrinsically global. Then you can implement whatever you want, but basically once they are in the cloud, Data are there, and they're basically. But, but also, data oh, data is an asset. Data is an asset that is not depleted if multiple people are using. Actually, the more you use it, the more is is going up, up in value. So it's a strange economical concept that people are saying data is an asset. It's not an asset. So what you want, if you're trying to constrain the usage of data, you are making a, uh, you are basically working against the force of nature <laughs> because yeah. the in the the the. the, the in, the uh, impulse is to use more and to use more the same. And so it's going to be interesting. 
Yeah. I'm just saying that you are, if you are going for the data career, I think is the it's probably the best moment in history, or probably the worst, depending which side of the <laughs> utopia. Of the utopia or of the dystopia. You yeah, will we be. either find ourselves with statues and universities, or we we'll find ourselves, you know, burned to a stake like the old saints, you know, the old like Giordano Bruno. That's my ambition. I want to be like Giordano Bruno at the Campo dei Fiori. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> one day. They so tell you to think that at the end, it, everything uh, leads to what you are, I mean, which side you are is related to whom you are, basically, because if you are an optimist and you believe in the intrinsic good nature of the humankind as a whole, then you, you end up that at the end it will be a positive solution. But if you think that negative force will prevail, this can be a very, very long process. I mean, it's... Uh, <sighs> Who knows? Uh, let's uh, say we don't have a very good track of record so far, but let's... Uh, no, let's look. exactly. That's okay. right. So thank you very much. No worries. Okay. Lorenzo. Thank you, thank you Lorenzo. Uh, is there any other question? Comment. Maybe people Clearly have time. Want to say, uh, uh, if I can, I will. Alessandro. Oh, no. okay. Alessandro. Ah, Alessandro. Alessandro. Yeah. Yes. Um, ah, Alessandro cannot miss in this. Uh, Why? Is it, one, is, one is asking very difficult questions, is he? No, no, he's always oh, uh, no. making questions. But I, I want to see Alessandro. <laughs> yes, yes. Can you see me now? Yeah. Now we can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, my question is regarding the, um, the fact that you said before about the culture of a company. Why, if in a company, uh, to work with data, uh, many different people with different backgrounds are needed, actually um, a few companies do that. They hire different people with different backgrounds. And so is this lack of vision something that generates from, uh, I don't know, an historical um, view of, of the company, or uh, is it something that actually is shared among all the companies and it's, in the, it's independent from, let's say, <laughs> the historical uh, um, cultural condition of no, no, there uh, is, the there is. there is definitely, there is an, I mean, if you look at the the so-called digital company, digital native company, the Google of the world, is, I mean, you don't need to explain the Google uh, executive what data is, right? Other companies, uh, which we're not going to name here, but they are having much longer heritage, and maybe they think the data is dashboards. Maybe data, for them, data is the, the thing that appears on the screen. Maybe data is this, the thing that sits on an ERP system. But because that's the first big cultural step that some of these companies has to make and say, ha, huh, so data is not what I see in the screen. Data is what we agree as a human being that we want to tell the customer. That's data. And, yeah. and that that's, doesn't come natural because, you know, things had evolved too fast. So people have gone through the IT revolution straight into the data revolution. So they're, they're confused. Then they think, oh, maybe uh, this is IT. And now that people have been talking AI, 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 and now they think, oh, data is AI. So the only thing I need to do with data is making an algorithm and having, and I can do something magic, something that I can build something that will actually fix all my data debt without me doing anything. And so that, that's where you, so there are, in, in the history of people like me, you see historical failure. And so you go into a place, they uh, try to do something, fails, someone is shown the door, someone else comes in with a different approach, and people, companies are still trying. There is nothing of what we do is standard. So I'll give you the example. If I go in a company, I'm a chief financial officer, and I say, hey, guys, I think we need one chart of account. Nobody will say anything. If I'm the CEO of the company, I say, hey, guys, we should have a logical data domain. People say, why? What do you need it for? What's the problem? Why can't you do this with a dashboard? So you see, it, it's it's the the fact that we are too young in this. It's too much on our craft. It's not a profession yet, and so what it creates is that uh, the the simplest thing you you go and you want to hire a person, and you go into your HR system and you search, okay, which profile you want to hire? You search data. There is no profile there. The simplest thing. Oh, so what's the best? So you search for data. The only thing is, 
database administrator. So I can't put this into the system, right? I want to yeah. hire a data analyst or a data architect or a data scientist. I don't have data scientists in my... So you see, that's a data problem for your job. So, that, so you see all kinds of things and uh, no one size fits all and uh, everyone is on a maturity journey. But they need to understand. As long as you understand that, you are on, a, on, a, on a already an advantageous point. And now, if I can say something from the data science of a point, uh, there is also another problem that uh, even data scientists are very few, because most of people who practice data science are people who come from different domain, have no solid background in the field. Nope. They just take tools off the shelf, because nowadays, if you know a little of Python and you know how to dig into GitHub, you can find the repositories where you can find all sorts of machine learning algorithms for any type of a problem. And, mo and if you see, uh, in, uh, there is a larger responsibility also from the academy in this field, because many application domain in the academy have basically uh, discover it suddenly that they can do data science, but they have not the background to do it. And therefore you have, for instance, a proliferation of article papers where, which basically are bullshit, to, to use a French term, basically, just because they are done in, in a very naive way, without the real understanding of what is behind the data, or now they need to be prepared, how they need, that, how the algorithm need to be tested, fine-tuned, validated against the data. But then, so, then, Giuseppe, adopted, right? Because the issue yeah. that they, in a companies usually say, oh, I have a problem, I have an app. Exactly. I have, buy a tool, buy a tool. GDPR, there is a GDPR tool. What? Exactly. So, and instead, in, in G, what the, uh, one of the uh, most beautiful formula, simple formula of G was, a solution effectiveness e equals quality of the solution times adoption so you can have the best tool in the world but if nobody's using it exactly. there's nothing you can do so that the culture bit comes over and over again it's all about how the people are using the things you're giving it what they're gonna do it and how you maintain the people on the path of the right exercise because you tell someone something today they do it once you move your, you just turn your head tomorrow, I'm going back to what they were doing yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and that's in Six Sigma, it's called Sigma long term. It's a shift. So literally you can measure the shifting quality from a Sigma short term. When I, I explain the solution, I give you the training, but then I forgot to put controls. So you have 1.5 on average Sigma shift from short term and long term, because what are people doing? Going back to the tried and tested. They go, they, we are human, we are habits. Hab uh, people of uh, animal of habits change is actually felt as pain in your neuropaths when you have to rewire your brain it's painful you don't want to do that okay thank you for your answer no worries thank you alessandro as you can say alessandro i can talk about this for hours so <laughs> yeah, we, we can organize the seminar i mean the meeting uh, that you have with miguel on friday afternoon we can do hey, it should, should we scientists, uh, <laughs> okay. we it. everybody everybody <laughs> let's talk this is a week about the one topic <laughs> uh, see, see, the, the, uh, so the, the work that myself and miguel were doing is going to end up in 2025 yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if i can uh, yeah. give uh, simply a uh, uh, something that makes me a wit witness of something interesting today. Uh, I'm very glad to, to have served as the link between these two very interesting uh, interlocutors. Uh, today we have we had a, a interesting dialogue. This is the, the reason why we are excited to, to, to make it uh, going on. Um, this should be uh, in a way planned. Uh, I, I'm sure we, we can do it. Uh, but the, the, the point is exactly what, uh, in many remarks, and especially from your side, uh, was uh, highlighted and stressed, I would say, is that the problem is not about know-how that could 
would fall of the pace uh, of data is culture that requires much more longer times to 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 it's gener it's generational to, to to be to get inside so uh, this is the interesting things we have we have very skilled people that comes from a lot of experience that talk dialogue with people that are younger enough to 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 avoid the risk that uh, you know it is very difficult to change to, the to, world. To, no, to, to teach new tricks to old dogs is, is the, the hard thing. Uh, we are lucky enough because we are in university and this that is something that I really appreciate. I'm very glad to be, in a sense, part of the community of data science. And uh, today we are also open at this for the students and this is quite interesting, uh, is that we are, are in, a, in a sense, on, on the edge, you, you explained, uh, contamination, multiculturality, uh, dialogue, uh, discussion. This is uh, quite important, and I'm very glad. This is that, met, met, uh, meta disciplinary approach. Which exactly. Is, uh, yeah. I mean, what exactly. we we, we exactly. have based uh, our <laughs> it's uh, our pilaster. <laughs> yes, yes. Some pillars. Uh, some yes. pillars. Uh, uh, I, I don't pillars. want. Yes. I don't want to say that I I I'm in in the in the previous. Uh, mm -hmm. Club, you, you explain it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, <we> get it. <laughs> uh, I, I really would like to say something. What, uh, what has really impressed me is that Roberto comes from a company experience dealing with the data. I come from astrophysics. By the way, thanks a lot for all those beautiful astronomical images you have used, I really appreciated that. I mean, it's obviously... It's I, I, know, I know you're a bit into music as well, Giuseppe. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Very yeah, much. So, so you, the, the virtuoso, I think, why well, you were appreciating that as well. <laughs> and the, and the, uh, I come from a completely different background, but what I realized is that we basically have had in, incredibly similar experiences and we have the same uh, understanding of where the problems are. People and that is, is really amazing because it means, I, I, to tell you the truth, this is an idea which is lingering in my head, but uh, sooner or later we'll, we'll, we'll uh, acquire some well-shaped form. There is uh, something behind the data which really is in common. It's a sort of a meta uh, significance of data, which still escapes understanding, but basically, and still escapes measures and uh, quant quantification, I would say. But it, it's not a coincidence that different domains with the different data types with completely different problems encounter exactly the same difficulties and the same uh, and the same philosophical problems I would say this is something which we really should discuss in our yeah. laboratory with the it isn't the point about again and it's just on the digital neo humanism for me what's behind the same thing is people and i will i will i will i would probably shock more even more lorenzo uh, saying that i i said to you right maybe the last 25 centuries of technological advancement has been a distraction because now we are at the point as humanity, as mankind, we can't go further until we resolve those problems that the guys looking at the stars and the planet S and going around and walking and discussing philosophy were already having. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my mom is, again, my mom knows that I was doing, uh, was doing this. I said, tell them to read the choir of the Antigones because in that you find old Sophocles already. already. So the stuff that as human beings, we knew as problem, as impediment for our advancement 25, years, 25 centuries ago. Are still there. The issue Only is that now we are at the encroaching point. So we are now seeing human sciences, technical sciences. If we don't get them together, we jump ahead as humanity. We're going to go down the dystopia side, I think. You, you can also see from a different perspective. I, I'm writing something for an article which Nicola asked me to do it. By the way, Nicola, it's progressing. And, and I start from 
a statement by Jacques Monod, he got the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology in 1976, and uh, who basically says that since after the discovery of fire, the uh, uh, human uh, reaction to change in the environment has no longer been uh, following the Darwinian rules of the survival of the fittest, but it has become a survival of culture. We adapt to a changing environment because we change our culture. And in this moment, data are at the center of our culture. So basically, yeah, our capability to survive as a species, basically, in this changing environment, yeah. is related to our capability to exploit the information content which is in the data yeah. and to adapt to it. So it's, it's, the com it's the complexity pinpoint that we are at, yeah. that we without solving with data, we it's going to be tough. Yeah. I have goosebumps, but um, I mean, we're getting too, so too it's deep real, now. It's really data science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's we the really science of data. We need, like it's data data science time. we need to find a way to systematize this interaction with yes. Roberto, because Roberto is really, yes, can be a wonderful contribution to the formation of our students. I must okay, say we, we can add uh, another, uh, another uh, uh, teaching uh, course uh, in data science uh, about data excellence. <laughs> Happy to help. I mean, that's uh, part of my dream. Is to, is willing, uh, eventually to give a short course on uh, remote officers. Fantastic. We, we, we can do with this. Us. I mean, it's the okay. I, I do when I do these things, I actually feel better. I mean, I'm going to go downstairs and uh, yeah, if, uh, if I'm, you made my evening. I'm, I'm, that's the stuff, the stuff I like to do. So well, yeah. thank you. So Pepe, I can tell I can tell you now because we are recording. There are a lot of students, but also the other guy up, uh, above my screen is Michele. Can uh, give yes. a, a, a really a high contribution to our data science uh, master yeah. degree course in uh, in a new subject like uh, data literacy or like uh, quantitative storytelling yeah. or visualization. I mean, what how? to communicate with uh, data and, and visualization okay. graphs, because this is a very important, uh, uh, Roberto uh, said something a few words uh, in his yeah. presentation, his seminar. I think it's a, a really a, a task. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, something that data scientists uh, should know very well how to uh, communicate. Because otherwise, the last mile of your work is yes, lost. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that, uh, Michele, can really, really offer you uh, offer an important contribution to this course. Definitely. More questions? So, no, I think we I think we're done. Uh, I think we're done. Uh, uh, Raffaele, Raffaele. <laughs> oh, Raffaele, Raffaele. Yes. yes, Raffaele. Yes. I, I, was, I was going to uh, ask you, uh, because I, 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 I saw your yeah. name in the... Uh, and I say, well, strange that Raffaello will also not make a question. Oh, because uh, I fall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was almost. I was was going to call you. <laughs> yes. And I said, well, maybe he's doing something. <laughs> yes. Uh, a question. A question. Uh, um, I work as a data architect for uh, an Italian company in R and D, and we have in in our little uh, our team of data science. Uh, not so expanded uh, as uh, you uh, have show, uh, showed us. Uh, for, uh, showed us. Uh, for example, uh, uh, semantic expert. We um, we are in touch with uh, uh, with potential clients uh, that uh, uh, very often uh, they are semantic experts. And uh, a question for for the, for these aspects. In your experience, uh, because the, the data is new oil, and so the companies um, are also um, very um, keen, uh, yes, very keen to 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 custodize their data, to uh, uh, to protect their data. In your experience, uh, how do you handle the? Um, the contract with uh, uh, um, with contractors. Um, uh, so um, uh, I, I try to explain uh, uh, better. 
Uh, if you uh, have... You can see also in Italian, maybe then afterwards... Or ah, okay. 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 Uh, ci tieni molto agli aspetti etici, agli aspetti di rischi sui dati, privacy e quindi è molto critico questo aspetto di gestire diciamo, delle persone che magari non appartengono alla tua, okay. Alla tua okay. organizzazione. Ok, so the point is how do I make sure that third parties are seeing the way I see the approach to data? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Ok. So the, the again it's, uh, it's the trickier, even trickier because now you're influencing an external culture. So what, what I usually do, I, I put my contractor or the, their managers or the, when we go into a master uh, agreement, kind of, they need to demonstrate me that they do data the way I want them to do. And they, there is a sort of a, a agreement on principles. You don't need to agree on policies, but you need to agree on principles. And it, the, the, the reason for me to put a charter of five points is a one and a half page. Believe me, it took a month and a half to write the right one and a half page. But in an half, an half page, you have five principles. It has to be standard, it has to be governed, it has to be resilient, it has to be compliance, it has to be ethical. I mean, as long as we agree on this, then it's down to, in the practice, I need to be sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, people that are getting in touch with my third parties are saying the same thing. We are walking the talk, as they say in English. So we are able to demonstrate that we are doing the right thing for data, so we expect the right thing for them. And, you know, you always want to be sure that um, not only the intentions are good, but also the mechanisms are good. So you need to build some controls, some digital or, uh, you know, human controls that will mm. make sure that when you do reviews with your contractors, with the people, you know that they're doing the right thing. So you can't just give them free reign into your data world and say, go, do whatever you want, right? There is to be some framework of reference, some understanding on principles, so that you know that what they're going to do is actually in line with your expectations. So things are, the, the, you know, most of the contracting that happens is on a time and material. So basically, basically you have people in, you make people part of your team, and you treat them like one part of your team. This actually is getting people that are contracting them sloppy because the, you, you treat them, you don't look at them as third parties anymore. You don't look at them as an extension of your team. So you don't take that care. I usually prefer to have contracts that are on fixed project or fixed deliverables. So I, I tell them exactly what I'm expecting and I can measure it. Now, this is more complex for you because you need to work more as a service, the, the guy that wants the service, but is more secure from a, from a you know, uh, co coexist, or oh, sorry, coherence and consistency of what you're expecting them to do in data. I don't know if you answer, but you yes, see what yes. I'm going with this. Yes, well, that because uh, I see that in many large companies, there is a trend that they uh, they hide directly the, the data science team because they, they believe that uh, they are very uh, important uh, resources and uh, but you uh, you need a simulation Rafael. there's a lot of simulation you need to do and uh, the assimilation is a, is a is a process you have to have in place so you need to sit them in a room and say this is the way we do things these are the words we are using you want them part of your tribes you want them coming out of the the room with your own uh, you know tattoos on so because the even if you have a contractor that goes and saying things like oh you want you don't want to say words like random forest right because you, in your company, you want to call it something different. And it happened, true story, someone will say, ah, oh, we're going to use random forest. So this came to the ear of a risk manager in a German company. And the next thing on a board meeting, they will say, we don't do things by random here. So how we can do it? So you, you, you want to manage messages. You want to manage the, the lingo. So you need to do a lot of assimilation and contractually need to be secure. OK, thank you. Right, thanks. For the okay, answer. thank you. Is there are any other questions? No, no. Well, I think no, it's we uh, well, at, at, at what time is it, uh, Roberto? What time is it? It's uh, six o'clock uh, at your uh, six twelve. Um, I'm actually requested to prepare the uh, in, in a little bit prepare dinner well, for the beasts. Roberto can prepare friarelli in uh, London. No, no, no tonight, he's, uh, tonight, he's producing friarelli in London. Tonight, he's producing friarelli in London. 
Veramente <ride> spezzatino di pollo col couscous. Tempo. Okay. <ride> ok, we can stop recording. We can uh, thank a lot uh, Roberto for this very, oh, very interesting. It was very interesting lecture. Uh, I well, I think uh, something to repeat when uh, we have uh, such uh, good enthusiasm. Of, I, mean, I think from everybody, a uh, lot of. Uh, Uh, to, a lot of uh, questions and also uh, I received some messages already that uh, was really a positive, uh, positive lecture. So I uh, thank you very much and uh, well, see you uh, on Friday. Sure. <laughs> for the Good meeting. night. Good night. See you, see you soon. soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Ciao, grazie. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao grazie.